RuneQuest started way back in 1978 and as of 2018 is now in its seventh edition. This edition, published by Chaosium, is called RuneQuest Roleplaying in Glorantha, or RQG for short. There are already a ton of supplements for it at this point, including an intimidatingly heavy set of books detailing the setting itself, the much-loved Bronze Age-inspired world of Glorantha, originally conceived by RPG legend Greg Stafford. In my last video, I covered the rules of RQG as they were presented in the starter set, a really great box set that can help you get started in this otherwise rather intimidatingly wide and deep role-playing game. In this video, I want to cover the setting of Glorantha, but again, only as it is presented in the setting primer found in the RQG starter set box. If you want to get acquainted with the rules and what's in the physical box, go ahead and check out my previous RuneQuest video. Otherwise, let's jump into this setting primer. My biggest question going into this was, was Chaosium able to encapsulate the 40 plus years of development for Glorantha into a 65 page booklet that actually communicated the wonder and the glory of the setting? The answer to that is, yeah, sorta. But first, let's take a look at the sponsor for this video, The Wanderer's Companion. Wanderer's Companion lets you forge a mighty hero with stickers. It's a sticker book designed to help you create a portrait of your RPG character. Comprised of over 600 stickers across 40 pages, you will be able to create at least 36 characters. Wanderer's Companion is great for players who are looking to visualize their next character or for GMs who are looking to populate their campaign with a rich cast of interesting NPCs, allies, and villains. The stickers are clear vinyl, reusable, and die cut. They are easy to layer to make your characters. Base stickers feature a diverse range of skin tones and features, and the collection includes a variety of clothing, hair, weapons, and accessories across a range of fantasy races, classes, and backgrounds. At the launch of the Kickstarter, the sticker book will accommodate eight fantasy races, human, dwarf, elf, halfling, half-elf, gnome, half-orc, and tiefling. More base sticker designs will be unlocked like fey, dragonborn, and elemental races. Wanderer's Companion comes with the option of adding the Treasure Trove Sticker Album, a 20-page reusable sticker album where you can store your creations and try out various combinations for your character designs. The link to this project is below. Now, back to the video. Right out of the gate, there are some very interesting core concepts about the world of Glorantha, and they're ones that you have to keep in mind when you first enter the world. For one, magic is everywhere. It's a part of everyday life. Not everyone can use so-called rune magic, but most everyone can use spirit magic spells. Another thing is that gods are real, and they play a part in people's lives with some frequency. I think the best way to approach these core concepts is to put yourself in the Bronze Age. That is somewhere between 3300 BC and 1200 BC. Think about all the cults and magical beliefs and superstitions back then. And now imagine that they were right about everything. Not necessarily the actual beliefs from our Bronze Age, but that level of ignorance of science and cosmology, that is the headspace where Glorantha exists. I don't mean to be disparaging though. I love this concept and find it infinitely fascinating. Anyway, for what it's worth, Glorantha is not just a cerebral thought experiment for cultural anthropology majors. There's a healthy dose of fantasy RPG trappings thrown in as well. One major source of those is the so-called elder races. Elves, dwarves, trolls, duck people, and all kinds of other races. Chaosium mentions these races, but really doesn't depict or really describe any one of these in the starter set booklet. By the end of this primer, I was left feeling that Glorantha could almost be conceived of as a human-only world, which it's not, but they just don't unveil any of those elder races here, really. As far as culture, it's stressed that most of civilization organizes itself into kinship groups or city-states. Common types of social units are tribes, cults, or clans, usually run by a ring of elders. There are some particular features regarding metallurgy in the setting I thought were pretty entertaining. So bronze is the metal most common, and it's made from mixing copper and tin, but it's also derived from the bones of dead gods. Then there is iron, which cannot be mined at all. It can only be bought, received, or stolen from dwarves. In other words, dwarves have a complete monopoly on the metal iron. Then there is gold, which is rare enough that only leaders and the ultra-wealthy throw it around. Runes are a central component of both the rules of this game as well as its setting. They are described as cosmic archetypes divided into four categories, elements, powers, conditions, and forms. 
The way they are described, drawn, and assigned to skills and weapons is really intriguing. There is a sort of completeness about these runes. They seem to comprehensively describe all of reality if you take them all into account. All of reality in the Bronze Age mindset. The one rune that stood out to me as being less than universal was this Dragon Newt rune. That one is a bit of a miss for me since it's just way too specific and setting dependent. Dragon Newts in the setting are basically dragons. There's a lot that this setting primer alludes to, but which I'm not sure is part of the player experience or not. Here's a great example. It says that elite members of a cult are rune masters called rune priests, rune lords, and god talkers. My guess is that players can assume these roles, but here they're just mentioned in passing. Another bit of teasing is this brief list of gods. This is not a full list of the gods of Glorantha, but ones that are important in the area of the world detailed in the starter set. I couldn't piece together much out of these descriptions other than there are seven Lightbringer gods as well as seven mothers. The Red Goddess is a particularly important god as we'll see in a minute. I think the takeaway here is that Glorantha's pantheon is huge and complex, and since they are tied to runes like your character and even your weapon, they are woven into the setting and into play a bit more closely than most RPG gods. There are only six elder races detailed to any degree in this book, and they are all found in this box. You have elves called Aldurami, dragon newts, the descendants of dragons and the oldest race in the world. They morph over time into full-blown dragons. Dwarves are called Mostali, merfolk are amphibious sea dwellers, trolls are trolls, and brew are a heterogeneous breed of, quote, Creatures of chaos, brutal beyond belief. Then they mention centaurs, intelligent ducks, baboons, giant scorpion men, and things with setting specific names that have no meaning without a description or illustration. I get it. This is a fantasy role playing game that's been in the oven for almost half a century. You're going to have a hodgepodge of fantasy races. But I think the setting could also be pretty cool as a human only one where more sober intercult politics and intrigue are front and center. There's a really cool note here about the PC's role in society. It's mentioned that most people are organized into clans or cults, which are in turn organized into tribes, which sometimes coalesce into cities. But no matter the size of the community, the PCs are supposed to be adventurers, quote, avatars, personifications of a million dreams, prayers, and curses, the hopes and fears of the future made flesh. So in other words, they are stalwarts in their cult or clan and their champions. This is an interesting concept because it means a PC is always known and there are always expectations put upon them regardless of what's happening in the story. This has the intended effect of creating interesting connections between PCs and their community, which hopefully lends to more interesting storytelling. Glorantha money is fairly involved. If you're bored of copper, silver, electrum, and gold, then you're in luck. In this setting, at least in this starter set area called Dragon Pass, silver coins are called Lunars. A coin called a cow is worth 20 Lunars. Gold coins called wheels are also worth 20 Lunars. A copper coin is called a clack and is worth about one-tenth of a Lunar. A bulge is a troll unit of exchange made of lead and it is worth one hundredth of a Lunar. One pretty striking feature of Glorantha, but which only gets about half a page in this booklet, is what the planet actually looks like. Well, it's not a planet at all. It's a lozenge shaped platform of land in the shape of the Earth Rune, aka a square, floating on an ocean that's called Sramax River. Above it is the Sky Realm, and below it is an underworld. Actually, there's also a middle world between sky and air, and the sky is a bowl that rotates around the pole star. So this is actually a lot to take in. I found myself reading these sentences over and over, trying to parse out just what exactly is going on with this world. There's this one little illustration that kind of helps. This difficulty, by the way, is something I encountered in a few different places in the book. The first place is the list of gods, which just seems like too much information crammed into too few words. Here, with the description of the local cosmology, again, it's just too brutally summarized to be of any use to a GM, and it will happen again later in the book. I'll let you know when we get to it. So, Dragon Pass. That's the mountainous region of the world that this entire starter set is focused on. I thought this was a pretty clever way to rein in the vastness of the setting and not overwhelm new GMs and players. 
But surprisingly, even this one small piece of the continent is practically overloaded with history. I know I'm going to mess up some details and trying to summarize it, but basically, there are two kingdoms struggling for power in this region, Tarsh and Sartar. They both want control of Dragon Pass. They have fought here before, and it will eventually culminate in this metaplot concept called the Hero Wars, a sort of climactic war to end all wars in the region. You have the Kingdom of Sartar, which is described as the default homeland for adventurers, a, quote, mountainous kingdom made up of storm-worshipping hill tribes, united by the royal house of Sartar. Then you have other civilizations like the matriarchal Ezrolia, semi-nomadic pony breeders of the grasslands, the barbarian nomads of Prax, the proud and arrogant people of Lunar Tarsh, and the proud and impoverished people of Old Tarsh. There are also countless pockets of elder races, trolls here, dragon newts there, dwarves in the dwarf mines, beast people in Beast Valley, and probably most significantly, the Lunar Empire, ruled by the wizard king called the Red Emperor. As for the actual history of all these kingdoms, I read through it a few times and I still don't have any desire to recap all of it. This is another instance in the booklet where there's just way too much information edited and crammed to fit into way too small of a space. They actually start with the beginning of the world itself, then breathlessly summarize thousands of years of history from the Dawn Ages to the awkwardly named Empire of the Worm Friends, up through the rise and fall and potential rise again of the Lunar Empire. As of this moment in the settings history where your PCs step in, heroes are gathering in Dragon Pass to fight in a final showdown with the Lunar Empire in defense of Sartar. I didn't exactly get a sense of why the Lunar Empire is so bad or what makes Sartar the good guys, but to be perfectly frank with you, at the time of this recording, I have yet to read the two adventure booklets that come with the starter set. Those things might be better explained there. The rest of this booklet, so really the majority of it, zooms into a single city within Dragon Pass called Johnstown and paints a very vivid picture of a fantasy Bronze Age city where you can set your adventures. This section starts with the history of the city itself. You can see from this timeline that the city was created by the arch wizard Sartar himself about 145 years before the present. Then the city fell to the Lunar Empire about 23 years ago. Then it was liberated pretty much within the last year. Things get really detailed in this section. Check out this passage about sea level and the geological intricacies of the area. I'm not sure if a GM busting out details like this during a session would be incredibly immersive or just banal. As far as tribes, there are four main ones comprising about 30,000 people in total, but they don't all live in the city proper. The city itself only contains about 2,500 people, so that gives you an idea of the scale of things here. Even the largest tribe in the local region only has about 8,800 people in it. One notable tribe are the Telmori, who are all straight up werewolves who have an ancient claim to their land. One of the great centerpieces of this whole book is this isometric illustration of Johnstown itself, which as you can see is sort of bifurcated into an upper city and a lower city divided into four distinct quarters. The booklet here goes into great detail with each of these sections of the city, but I will be sparing you those. There are some interesting features of the culture and governance of the city to be found in that sea of details though. One of which is the fact that the city government dispenses food and grain to citizenry largely free of charge, paid for through taxes and service. Food is a civil right in this city. Another important detail is how citizenship works. Out of the almost 3,000 inhabitants, only about 1,000 are citizens, and they earned that status by owning land, paying taxes, and being able-bodied enough to defend the city itself. The militia of the city is only about 500 strong, which I think is a pretty small force no matter how you slice it. That being said, Everything being on the small side of the spectrum is perfect for a starter set city. Here's a first taste of an NPC stat block, the city rex, or sort of mayor of the town. I think a lot of commenters in my last video on RuneQuest, which covered its rules as presented in the starter set, were put off by how complex some of the mechanics were, and this stat block is a pretty strong affirmation of that worry. It's just a lot to take in here and use at the table. Two things here on this page. First, these stat blocks are a bit shorter and virtually all of the ones to follow are this short or shorter. 
So the game is not relentlessly trying to beat you over the head with the stats, it was just that mayor guy that was a bit much. And second, check out the decorative prosthetic beard that this aristocratic woman wears. I can safely say I've never seen this before in an RPG or anywhere. Let me know in the comments if you happen to know of a real life historical equivalent for this. I find it very interesting. And boom, here's another prosthetic beard. This character is the chief priestess of the city library and in charge of all magical training. She has to work all day with that thing on her face. In the final stretch of this booklet, they try to cram in several dozen points of interest outside the city, but again, it's just too much information whittled down into too few words. I can't really blame the creators here. They were probably told to cover a list of points of interest, but just not given enough pages to do it. The fact is, as a GM, these descriptions are not nearly enough to flesh out a proper scene. They're barely enough to get started on a home brewed description, but here they are, tons of them. So, all right, here are my thoughts on RuneQuest Glorantha Starter Set setting booklet. Too much for just 64 pages. You've probably guessed that would be one of my cons listed at the end of this video since I've pointed it out several times already. I jumped into this booklet without knowing virtually anything about Glorantha, and I was very curious to see how much it would be able to reveal to me. And by the end of it, I'd have to say that it was just the slightest taste. To be fair, only a third of the booklet is dedicated to Glorantha at large, the rest being about Johnstown, which means the task was all the more impossible. You have to remember Glorantha has been unpacked across multiple long form source books, so 20 pages is just not enough to even remotely do it justice. But also with regard to the outlying points of interest around Johnstown, there just wasn't enough space dedicated to do the job properly. A taste of something great. On the flip side, this teaser of the setting was enough to fulfill its intended purpose with me, which was to draw me further into the product line. I may or may not do any videos on the full RuneQuest roleplaying in Glorantha books, but I did in fact buy the Leatherette slipcase set, which includes the core rulebook, bestiary, and game master's pack, as well as several Leatherette adventure supplements. Even these few pages in this booklet were enough to captivate me and leave me thirsting for more. I want to know more about the gods and how various cults are structured, and even though a part of me cringes at all the fantasy creatures and races and just wants a humanocentric world, I need to know what these elder races are all about. Johnstown is fully realized. The name of this booklet should really be called Johnstown because the majority of the pages are dedicated to the city. It is painstakingly, lovingly detailed quarter by quarter, and the named PCs are all woven into its society in such a way that GMs are given a living, breathing city to work with. This city acts as the first real point of contact between a GM new to Glorantha and the vast setting itself. And I think, although it might be a bit over detailed in terms of what you'd actually use in play, it's full of details that actually get you into the right headspace. So that's about it. I'm left with way more questions than answers. The booklet titled Book Two, The World of Glorantha was not very illuminating of the world of Glorantha, but it left me wondering all kinds of things. The fact is, maybe the rules of RuneQuest 7th edition are a bit too complex or overwrought, but that doesn't stop me even for a moment from wanting to dive into the setting and its deeper details. I'd love to know in the comments if you've read any of the source books for Glorantha and what your experience with the world has been over the years. And if you'd like to support the channel, please join my Patreon. Links for everything are below. Thanks for watching. See ya.